Subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Today on Ralph Reads, we attend the fourth screening of Donald Goins' crime drama, Daddy Cool. Continue the quest, reach destiny and rest, let the reading Commence. Chapter 10 It was dark outside, even though it was still early. Janet glanced up at the sky. It looked like rain. She prayed silently that it wouldn't, because if it did, it would make her business bad. For the hundredth time, she remembered that today had been her birthday. How good it would have made her feel had Ronald given her a small gift. It wouldn't have had to be anything expensive, just the idea that he remembered. She had just told him about it the night before, but he had probably forgotten. His mind was busy thinking about his trap money and nothing else. As she stopped on the corner to let the traffic clear, she bent down and glanced in the passing cars. One white man stared back at her and she beckoned her head for him to turn the corner. She stepped back on the curb and watched the car turn and then stop. She moved back from the crosswalk, staring up and down the street to make sure no police saw her. It was funny, she reasoned, as she approached the car, that one month ago, if someone had told her she would be out on the streets turning tricks, she would have laughed at them. It would have been unbelievable. Yet, here she was out on the street selling her wares, just like the rest of the black women, moving slowly up and down Woodward Avenue. Hi, she said to the aging white man behind the wheel. The man, nearing fifty, with grayish hair and a large pot belly, stared back at the attractive young black girl. He considered himself lucky tonight. The girl was young and exceptionally good-looking. Hi, yourself, he said happily. Would you like to have a little fun? She inquired, her voice dropping into a husky whisper. I don't know, he stalled, staring at her hungrily. It all depends on how much the fun might cost. I don't know, she countered. About how much could you spend? For the next ten minutes, they seesawed back and forth. Janet started at fifty dollars, but had to come down. Well, she stated, with her hand on the door. If you can't spend any more than that, I had better be going. Wait a second, the man stated, panic in his voice. 
I just might be able to raise $20, but no more than that, he continued. A girl back on the other corner was going to go with me for just $15. Well then, Janet stated, her anger rising. Maybe you had better go back to that other corner and find that girl. Like I told you, she finished, opening the door slightly. If you can't spend at least $30 with me, you better find somebody else. The price was high, and the man realized it. But on the other hand, the girl was damned attractive. I'll tell you what, sweetie, he replied. I'll give you $25, but not a penny more. For just a second, she started to turn it down. But in the back of her mind, she knew Ronald would have a fit if he knew she had turned down $25. Okay, Whitey, she said slowly. I don't generally go for that amount, but for you, I'm going to make an exception. The white man began to smile. He watched the black skirt she wore rise up around her pretty golden brown thighs as she closed the door. He couldn't take his eyes off her lovely legs. Hey, man, she cried out. If you don't watch what you're doing, we're going to have an accident, she said as he pulled away from the curb and almost ran into another car. With patience, Janet directed him to an alley behind Cortland near 2nd Street. She had him drive up behind a condemned house and park. Now it was completely dark. She could see the glow of the cigarette that he smoked. Okay, honey, she said in her soft voice. Oh, oh, yes, he said, then fumbled around in his pocket and tried to peer into it to find the correct amount of money. He pulled out a 20, then couldn't find a 5. The first bill he came out with was another 20. Janet slid over and put her hand on his leg. She ran it up between his legs and grabbed this tiny, sinny f with her hand on his d she began to beg all the time playing with him. Aw, oh, baby, I know you can't afford to give me that little bit of change. If you want Mama to treat you right, you'll set me out properly. The man's breathing came heavy. Now, he began, we already reached the price. I'm not going back on my word, so why should you go back on yours? Without answering, she opened his fly. But for some reason, she couldn't locate the small tinny she sought. His breathing became ragged. Now, he cautioned, if you want to enjoy yourself, you'll have a little patience. Aw, oh, honey, she cried. You're not about to put this big thing in little old me, are you? She whined in his ear. The words she said were the magic ones because he seemed to swell up with pride. Oh, he began. Do you really think it's large? A note of surprise was in his voice, and she heard it and knew she had him. Large? Jesus Christ, honey, what have you been doing with this thing? You must have been a stallion for a horse farm. By now, she had finally found a tiny sinny and began to work it out of his pants. His chest swelled with pride. Here, he said, and pushed the two $20 bills into her hand. I'm gonna give you a bonus, just because I think you will satisfy me, he stated. She smiled to herself, then placed the money inside her bra. Okay, honey, she said coyly. How do you want us to do it? The old-fashioned way or French? If she could have stopped and heard herself, 
Janet would have known she had come a long way from the blushing virgin she had been just a month ago. Nah, the man stated quickly. I like it the old way. Maybe next time we can experiment. But this time, I want to fill your calf up. He grinned in the dark to himself as he wondered what his wife would say if she could hear him talking now. And how the hell would she feel if she heard this experienced talking about how large he was? It gave him a rare feeling of being somebody, even though every day he worked in the doll bank with doll people coming to him for loans. Janet stretched out on the front seat. She pulled her mini skirt up, revealing her dark, silky patch. He mounted her slowly, his dick already off, and she could feel something. She prayed to God that he didn't have a disease of any kind. Okay, honey, she said in her false voice. Mama done took care of you. Like hell you have, he stated, getting nasty as he realized that his money was gone. He felt like he had been cheated. We should go one more time, he began to beg as she moved from under him and sat up quickly. Yeah, man, she answered softly. We can go again, but it's going to cost you some more money. More money, Hal, he swore, his anger rising. I just gave you $15 more than I was supposed to. Now it's time for you to be a little nice to me, he stated, sure of himself, knowing that he would be able to handle the young girl if she gave him any more trouble. He had made up his mind. Either she was going to f*** again for no money, or he would take his money back. At the thought of getting his money back, he began to smile. Even if she f***ed again, he decided to take his money back. Why the hell not, he asked himself after glancing up and down the dark alley. There was nobody to come to a rescue and nobody to identify him. He had his mind made up on just how he would go about doing it. Then he turned around toward her. It was just at that moment that Janet made her move. She hadn't missed his eyes as they swept up and down the dark alley. She was already afraid of turning tricks and cars, so she was always on her guard. She believed she had read his mind. When he turned back toward her, her hand hit the release button and the door sprang open. She was out in the flash. His cry of rage followed her, but it was too late. With the speed of youth, she fled. She flew down the alley, then heard the car motor start up. But it was too late. She made a left turn and ran through a yard that she knew from past experience was always deserted. As she came out on the street, she could hear the trick yelling. She remembered the flat pocket wallet he carried and regretted that she hadn't been able to lift it from the man. After once reaching the safety of the well-lighted side street, Janet felt at ease. She didn't believe that John would have enough nerve to accost her on the street, so she just as quickly put him out of her mind. Swaying her hips in a flirting manner, she switched down the street, well aware of the impression the passing men got of her. Ever since she was a child, people have been telling her how cute she was. Being admired was nothing new. As she walked along, she removed the ample bankroll that she had earned that evening and started to count the money. With what the last trick had given her, it brought her night's earnings to over a hundred dollars. The money didn't excite her. 
She was used to it. Her father had been extravagant with expensive gifts for her, so she was accustomed to large bank rolls. At home, she had always kept pocket change that at times exceeded two or three hundred dollars. Since today was her birthday, she felt like spending something on herself. She was still too young to have any apprehensions of overspending her trap money. Ronald didn't put her on any quota, so whatever she came home with, she believed he would be happy with. For the few weeks she had been working, she realized that she had earned enough for him to pay ten car notes if that was the problem. But her mentality was too high for her to have any delusions on that matter. Ronald was a pimp, and that was all there was to it. He had turned her out, even though she still didn't quite know how he had done it so easily. Yet here she was, out on the streets, selling <laughs> No matter how much contempt she had for herself, Ronald, she would do anything he asked, just as long as she was able to remain his woman. A car pulled up beside her. Simultaneously, she flashed her new smile and started toward it, her hips swaying enticingly. Without a real close scrutiny of the driver, she opened the passenger door and got in, smiling brightly. The smile on her face froze as she saw who the driver was. For a minute... She was tempted to open the door and jump out and run. Wild thoughts ran through her mind, but for some strange reason, she could do nothing. Shame was the main reason that she sat rooted to the car seat. She knew he had seen her trying to flag down other cars. There was nothing she could say. She dropped her head and stared down at her shoes. Hey, kitten, he said gently. I didn't come here to find you, just to see you looking blue. I remember that today was your birthday and hoped maybe we could have dinner or something together. Oh, daddy, she cried. Then the floodgates opened and all the pent-up emotions she had been holding back came spilling out. Daddy Cool leaned over and took his daughter in his arms. She cried as though her heart was broken. As he held her tenderly, he had to fight down a lump that came into his throat. He stroked the back of her head and spoke gently to her. Now, girl, it ain't nothing that bad, is there? I know I raised a girl who could just about handle everything that came up. Janet fought back the rest of her tears. She raised her hand and wiped the tears from her cheeks. Damn, she swore. I'm just ruining my makeup. His laughter was soft, yet relaxing to her. He hadn't accused her of anything. Soon the shame she had felt began to leave. She even managed to raise her head and look him in the eye. Daughter and father stared at each other. There was so much resemblance between them that a stranger couldn't help but know they were kin. Now... How do you feel? he inquired. After all them tears, I know you must feel better. Janet tried another smile. This time, it was the real thing. Not the fake bright smile she put on for the tricks. Her heart was in this one. It was natural. Her whole face seemed to brighten up. Her beautiful teeth gleamed in the darkness of the car. As the two stared into each other's eyes, a bright light hit them. 
Daddy Cool raised his arm, trying to block out the light that was blinding him. God damn it, he growled. Get that fucking light out of my fucking face! Oh, I'll get it out of your fucking face, all right. A tall, uniformed, white police officer stated as he stared into the car. All right, both of you out of there! Cursing angrily, Daddy Cool shoved his door open quickly, catching the policeman's knee. The officer yelled and cursed loudly, bringing his partner on the run. What the hell is going on here? The black officer asked as he came up. He stared from his limping partner back to the angry, red-faced Daddy Cool, who was glaring at the policeman he had hit with the door. Book this bastard for disorderly conduct with a prostitute, the white policeman said harshly. We're going to run both their asses out in and give this young ho a ticket for plying her wares on a business street. I just wish the fuck you would run us downtown and charge us with some ish like that, Daddy Cool stated, his temper almost getting out of control. Daddy? Janice said softly. Now control yourself. The policeman just made the mistake, that's all. The black officer saw what his partner had missed, how alike the two people looked. He was sure that this was a father and daughter even before she called him Daddy. The white officer finally shook the kinks out of his leg. Okay, you, he said to Daddy Cool. Get up against that f***ing car and spread your legs. Wait a minute, Mac, his partner said. I think there has been a mistake here. Mistake my ass, the officer roared. Both policemen were officers who walked the beat. Each was still young, neither man over 25. Mac had seen Janet working earlier, but had not been able to catch her before she got in the car and rode off. Now he knew he had her and believed he had caught her with a trick. I don't know where the hell you were at, Bill, when we walked up. Didn't you see this bastard pawing the hell out of her in the front seat? At least the bastard could have had the decency to pull up in a f***ing alley and do his dirt, but no, hell no, not this j***. He was getting ready to ball the little fluff right in the front seat on Main Street. Damn it! Daddy Cool roared as Janet clutched desperately at his arm. You fucking filthy mouth white motherfucker you! I'll have your ass for this! The sudden outburst surprised the angry white officer. The black policeman stepped in between them because he knew the angry black man in front of him was about to attack his partner. Now, you just slumber down there, brother, he said good-naturedly. Mac was surprised by the actions of his partner. What the hell goes on here? He yelled. I want this bastard in irons, so we can put a call in and have a car pick them up. Just hold on, Mac, Officer Bill stated. I keep trying to tell you we have made a mistake here. This guy was not trying to make out with his young lady. This is his daughter. Daughter hell! Mac exploded. I'm not buying no crap like that. I know what I saw, and I'm willing to back it up in court. Well, I'm not, Bill stated. I'll never be laughed out of the station every time I arrive for work. Now stop roaring like a damn bull. And use your eyes, man. A fucking blind man could tell you this is father and daughter here. So how the fuck are we going to run them in on a charge of prostitution? For a brief second, Mac hesitated. But he didn't like it at all. He believed he had seen them making out and didn't have any idea of changing his mind. I know what I saw, he stated doggedly. I know what you saw too, you 
ignorant mother Daddy Cool stated harshly. The cuss words didn't help matters out any. The white officer got red in the face and stuck his narrow chest out like a bantam rooster. Just slow down, brother, the colored policeman said. I'll handle everything here. Now, nah, f*** that ish. I want you guys to run us in on every charge that your partner dug up. I just hope the hell you do so I can sue the sh out of you and the city, Daddy Cool stated, his eyes blazing with smothering anger. Janet started to laugh, a soft giggle that began to build up until she was bent over with mirth. While she laughed, another pair of policemen came up. Only this time, this pair was riding in a patrol car. They got out and walked over. In seconds, the officer called Bill had explained what had happened, while his partner glared angrily around like an enraged bull. The two new arrivals took one glance at the couple about to be arrested and laughed. I wouldn't want to be the ones who wrote out the charge against them, one of the late arriving officers stated. His partner stated coldly, Just make them show ID, that's all. That should clear the matter up fast enough. I don't have any on me, Janet stated quickly, remembering that Ronald had made her leave everything with a real name on it at home so that if she got busted, she can use a phony name. Well, there's your charge right there, one of the policemen said. She ain't got any ID on her, so you could take her down and run a make on her. I just wish the f you would, Daddy Cool stated harshly. My daughter is only 16 years old, and if you take her down to a police station, I'll spend $10,000 trying to hang your ass up for it. Now, every one of the policemen stared at Daddy Cool sharply. They didn't like being threatened, but if she was underage, like he said, it could become a sticky problem. I'll tell you what, Officer Bill said. Why don't you just get back into your car with your girl and leave? We'll forget this crap ever happened, okay? Mac glared at him hotly. He didn't like the idea at all. He was sure that the couple was putting shit on them. He remembered what he had seen and wouldn't change his mind. For myself, Mac stated loudly. I'd still like to take them down and charge them, just like I said from the beginning. I know what I saw, and I don't give a damn how much they look alike. I believe they were carrying on unlawfully parked right here on the fucking street. Man, 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 Janet said. I can see now they don't hire police for their brains, that's for sure. She stared right at the policeman who wanted to arrest them. Well, I just hope to hell you do take us down and charge us with some bullshit, Daddy Cool said. Officer Bill shook his head. He wasn't about to let his partner shove them into something that would make them the laughing stock of the police station. The two other officers stood in the street undecided. If they were going to poke the couple, it was up to them to drive the arrested couple down to the station. Neither man wanted any part of it. They could see the relationship between the father and daughter. Mac, the driver of the cruiser said, I think you had better listen to your partner in this one, man. This thing can get out of hand, and I for one don't like the idea of being made a fool of. Despite the warning, Mac still hesitated. He knew he could force the issue, but if he did, he would be going against the wishes of all three of the other officers. He hadn't been on the force long enough to want to arouse the anger of the men in the squad car. As far as the black officer he worked with, he couldn't care less about what his partner felt.
In fact, if he had his wish, he wouldn't even work with the black man, even though the Negro had never done anything against him. He just didn't like the idea of having a black man for his partner. Anxiously, Max stared at the two white officers, trying to find support for his actions in their faces. Each man only stared at him coldly. It was obvious that none of them wanted the trouble Mac was starting. He tossed his hands in the air. Okay, if you guys want to let this fluff get away, it's up to you. I won't force. That's as far as he got. Daddy Cool roared loudly, his voice drowning out the policeman's. That's it! I've had enough! I want all three of you other officers to be my witness! I've listened to this ignorant ass bastard insult my daughter too many times! I've had enough! You can't pay common courtesy to a black woman! Well, I'm going to find out why he can't! He stated as he took out a pencil and began to write the officer's badge number down. The officer stared from one to the other bashfully. They knew that now the shit was in the fan. If the man reported it, they would have to make out a report. Max ass would be in a sling whether or not he knew it. Insulting a child in front of a parent wouldn't go down lightly with the captain. You wanted to find out if she was my daughter. Well, you damn sure will. Cause I'm going down to the station right now and reporting this. This officer has called my daughter a wh and worse in front of me. And not just one time, but numerous times. Even after I've informed him that she's only 16. Daddy Cool was breathing hard, and there was no doubt in the policeman's mind now whether or not this was the father. They knew he was. Bill tried once more to smooth things out. Come on now, Mr. Jackson. Let's let sleeping dogs lie. It's all been one big mistake, but I believe we can all forget it. No one has been hurt, so let's just go our own way. Finally, Mac realized that he might have put his foot in his mouth, but his pride was too much. To let him apologize. Come on, Daddy. Janet said. This has been a wonderful birthday present for me. Listening to you give these officers hell was enough. Let's forget about it and go have that dinner you were promising me, okay? She hoped desperately that he wouldn't do what she asked because she knew Ronald wouldn't like the idea of her going down to the police station. Once she did that, Every time she hit the street, one or the other of the officers will be harassing her or picking her up and taking her down to the station. Even now, she knew she was marked. She wouldn't be able to work the streets here any longer. Actually, Daddy Cool didn't really want to go to the station, but he would go if he was pushed. The less he came in contact with the police, the better off he was. Policemen had a tendency to remember faces, so it was best he kept his out of sight. Come on then, honey, he said sharply. I don't like the idea of giving in to them, but if you insist, we'll let the matter go this time. But I can't stand any more of this sh**. Daddy Cool waited for Janet to get into the car. I hope you boys realize, he added, staring coldly at the policemen, how lucky you are, because I believe I could have somebody's ass for this shit.
None of the policemen spoke. They just stared angrily at the couple in the car. Each man was busy with his own thoughts. None of them wanted any part of the captain's office. Daddy Cool started up the motor of his car. I wish you would change your mind, Janet. I'd love to follow this mess up. I don't like the idea of them talking that way to you. She blushed. It gave her a warm feeling to know that he cared for her that much. She knew that he had seen her working, but he never let on that he had. From his behavior, she reflected, in all probability, he might not have realized that she was really working. Maybe he had just thought she was trying to get a ride. But his very next words made her realize how foolish this thought had been. If you're going to do that kind of work, child, you should try and get in the house instead of out on the street. Anything can happen to you, but I don't want to lecture you, Janet. You're a woman now, so whatever you do is your business. If you like that kind of thing, it's nothing I could do about it, but pray that one day you will see the light and realize that you don't have to do nothing like that. He removed the white envelope from his pocket and tossed it in her lap. That's your birthday present from me. It's cash. I don't know, maybe you need it. I'm hoping it will stop you from doing what you've been doing. He hesitated, then continued. There's $2,000 in there, Janet. It's enough to keep you off the streets for quite a while. If you should ever need any more, all you gotta do is pick up the telephone and call me. I'll see to it that you get all the cash you need. He pulled over and parked behind a cab stand. Maybe it would be better if you took a cab home, unless you want to go home with me. She heard his words and was tempted, remembering how safe she felt in his arms. She knew he was waiting patiently and praying that she would accept his offer. He wasn't trying to force her to come home, just offering it to her. But she knew in her heart she couldn't accept. She didn't believe she could live without Ronald. Janet slowly opened the car door. There were tears in the corner of her eyes. I'll remember, Daddy. I swear I will. And if I ever need anything, you'll be the first person I call. She took a quick glance at him as she closed the car door. For a brief second, she thought she saw tears in his eyes, but she refused to accept such an idea. Daddy Cool would never cry. That much she was sure of. Chapter 11 After his daughter got out of the car, Daddy Cool sat silently behind the steering wheel and watched her in his mirror as she got into a cab. For a brief second, he was tempted to follow her, but just as quickly disregarded the idea. Janet sat back in the seat of the cab, huddled up like a small rag doll. Tears rolled down her cheeks, but this time she wasn't concerned with her makeup. If her father had only taken her in his strong arms and made her go home. No, she reflected. It wouldn't have done any good. She would have only slipped away at the first chance she got. The way he did it was the best way. He was allowing her to make her own mess out of her life, giving her free room to make all the mistakes she wanted to. He also told her that there would always be a place waiting for her, so she knew if she ever got tired of the life Ronald was making her live, she could go back home. But she had other ideas now. With the large sum of money her father had given her, it was enough for Ronald to settle down and take care of her. They had enough to buy them a small store or something. She daydreamed as she rode home. Now all they had to do was get married. 
She planned on bringing it up as soon as Ronald came to get his trap money. This time, he would listen to her. She would make him listen. None of his other women would be able to give him as much money as she carried. It was enough, she believed, for them to make another start. One thing she was sure of, she was finished with the street. There would not be another night like tonight. She remembered the shame she felt when she realized her father knew what she had been doing. And then he asked if she liked doing it. He didn't seem to think she was doing it for the money, and he never mentioned Ronald, so maybe he really thought that she was doing what she liked. She blushed again. How could she ever get herself into such a mess? But then again, she reflected as the driver pulled up to her apartment building. Maybe it was better if he thought that because if he knew that she was only working the streets because of Ronald, there was no telling what her father would do. She knew all too well how good he was with knives because he had taught her how to toss them too. So she knew that Ronald wouldn't stand a chance against her father if Daddy Cool ever got mad and called Ronald out. For all of his loud talk, Ronald would be like a baby against her father. She shivered at the thought. The last thing she could do was let him know the truth. No matter what happened, Daddy Cool must not find out that she had a pimp. But it was out of her hands. Daddy Cool already knew she had a pimp. He knew about it, but didn't know what he should do to the man who turned his daughter out. He had been around the game all of his life. In fact, when he was younger, he had had a few whores himself, so he was faced with a very difficult problem. As he drove slowly home, there was a fixed determination on his face, which, if Jenna had seen, she would have been in even greater fear for Ronald's life. No matter how sensitive the problem was, Daddy Cool knew he couldn't keep on ignoring it. He had put on a good act tonight, hiding the fact that he had been hurt badly when he saw Janet walking up and down the streets trying to stop tricks. He had to see it for himself before he could really believe it. Now he has seen what everybody else was talking about. It was up to him to figure out what was to be done. He knew behind a life of experience who was to blame. His daughter had just run into a smooth-talking pimp, that was all. And in her inexperience, she believed she was in love with the man. He could sympathize with her because he knew what the root of the problem was. Yet, he hadn't come up with the solution. When a tooth hurts you, you have it removed, he reasoned as he pulled up in his driveway and parked. After what he has seen tonight, there could be no more evasions, that he was sure of. Something had to be done. But what? The same thought kept springing back into his mind. Removing the source of the problem, then let the rest of it work itself out. Janet paid off the cab driver and made her way upstairs to her tiny apartment. It was clean, but other than that, it was a come down for a young girl who was used to everything a girl could want. As she stretched out on the couch, she thought about how she had been planning on going to college this year. It must have really hurt her father when he thought about it. They had talked about what school she would go to so many times in the past. He had promised to buy her a small car so that she could drive back and forth without any trouble. Now she thought about it, she realized that she had thrown all that away. And for what? To work the streets, lying down with any dirty old man who came her way. 
As she remembered what one man had forced her to do, she blushed, holding her head while he made her s <laughs> Then feeling the stuff filling her mouth until she was choking on it. The thought of it made her jump up from the couch and run into the bathroom where she was sick. After that, she took a shower, trying to wipe off the memory of all the men she had had. She couldn't scrub hard enough to make her forget. No matter how quickly they... She knew she was in the wrong life. It was something she knew she could never adapt to. Ronald would have to make up his mind, no matter how badly she wanted him. She swore to herself she would never go back to the streets. The thought of the large sum of money she had for him made her sure of her stand. After he got that, he wouldn't be any hurry to send her back to work. After showering, Janet daydreamed about how they would spend the money together. Maybe Ronald would take her on a trip. How nice that would be, just the two of them. New York, or maybe catch a plane and go to Mexico. Taking her time, Janet dressed with care. She was ravishing in a short silk nightgown she wore. Each time she took a step, it flared out around her, revealing her gorgeous profile. Being really unsophisticated, Janet didn't have a hard time in making herself believe her daydreams. She honestly thought that Ronald would do what she asked. Subconsciously, a warning bell went off, but she ignored it. She didn't even want to face up to the thought that he might not go along with her plans. Every time she had a doubt, she remembered the money, and that would bring a smile to her lips. She spread the money out on the bed and recounted it. Where what she had, there was over $2,000. She decided to keep the money she had made and just give Ronald the money her father had given her for a gift. The money was still spread out on the bed when the doorbell rang. She sprang up and ran to the door. As soon as Ronald entered, she threw herself into his arms. He pushed her back and stared coldly down into her face. Hey, baby, he said coldly. I went up on the stroll to find you, but the bitches working up there said you had pulled up with some trick. What's the idea of you coming in before I came down and got you? Honey, she said breathlessly. I got a hold of some big money, and I knew you didn't want me working in the streets with all that money on me. Yeah, he said coldly. Just how much is big money? He was still using his chilling voice. Trying to make a game out of it, she beckoned to him. Come on, honey. I'll show you, Janet said, and led the way back toward the bedroom. She smiled brightly as she watched him approach the bed and begin counting the money. After about ten minutes of watching him, she realized that he was really having trouble counting it. She walked over to the bed as she set the money down and began counting it all over again. There's two thousand dollars there, she said lightly, watching his face for some kind of emotion. If there was any, it was anger that he wasn't able to handle figures. Ronald had always had trouble counting, and for some reason, he hated people to know that fact. Big deal, he snarled coldly. It was a good sting, baby, he added almost affectionately. Aren't you pleased? Janet asked, waiting for him to sweep her off her feet. He seemed to have changed since she had begun working for him. Sure, I'm pleased, he stated, getting over his anger that she had discovered he couldn't count large sums. How the hell did you rip it off, Jan? I ain't taught you how to sting. No, honey, I didn't steal it. My daddy came down and found me working, then he gave it to me for my birthday present. Oh, 
he answered, and his mind went over what she had said. Then he thought of something. Well, if your daddy gave this to you, what happened to the cash you made before he came down? Oh, 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 I got that, Ronald. She began, then hurried over to the dresser and opened it. She quickly removed the money she had placed there. When she turned around, he was scowling. What kind of s*** is this s***? He cursed, then slapped her across her face. You didn't hold out on me. Just because your daddy gave you a few funky bucks, you don't hold out the rest of the money on me. She was too shocked at first to think. It wasn't the slap that hurt either. It was the ingratitude that he showed. I wasn't trying to hold back any money, she managed to say. What you mean, shit? You wasn't holding back no cash, he snarled. If I hadn't mentioned it, you wouldn't have brought it out. I know what you were planning on doing with it, too, he added. What? What was I going to do with it? Janet inquired, fighting to get her senses together. Nothing was going like she had planned. You were going to hold it and put it with the money you made tomorrow at work so that you could make me think you're just one hell of a Put it with the money I was going to make tomorrow? She cried. The thought hadn't even entered her mind. She had believed she wouldn't have to work again. What about the money I have tonight? I know you don't expect me to go back into the streets tomorrow night. She stared at him dumbfounded. Shit, he swore. Ignorant as shit at that, you damn well had better go back to work tomorrow. Do you think because you gave me two funky grand that I'm going to let you lay around for a week or better? Shit, he screamed. You must be out of your dick up for the way I got back in mind. Seething with an unknown anger, she stared coldly at her pimp. You don't appreciate nothing I do, do you? She asked, finally seeing the light. I don't know what you mean by that, shit. He said blindly, not being smooth enough to see the damage he had done. Shit, I need fresh money every day. It don't make no difference how much you make tonight. Tomorrow is always another day, you dig? Yeah, she answered harshly. I'm really beginning to dig. You can bet on that, she said as she put her hands on her hips and stared coldly at the man she had believed she loved. Finally, common sense warned him that he was trying to play the hard Mac too hard. He saw at once that he was about to blow a good young ho and reversed his behavior. Aw, baby, he said, taking her into his arms. I was just jiving with you. You know the way them hard-ass pimps do in the movies and shit. Now, you know I'm gonna let you rest up and we party. Come on and give daddy a big hug, he said, and began to kiss her passionately around the neck and shoulders. It's a good thing you came to your senses, she managed to murmur between kisses. Because I was going to take back my daddy's money and let you go your own damn way. She was being honest with him. For a minute, he went rigid in her arms, then caught himself. This bitch is crazy, he told himself as he kissed her again, passing up the desire to check her for being out of line. Take back the money, he reflected, almost laughing as he thought about her stupidity. The only thing she would have gotten for her trouble would have been an kicking. But he decided not to push it. It was easier to make love to her, which was something that he really enjoyed since she looked so good. But Janet was thinking coldly about her father's gift. It never entered her mind that she would have any trouble getting the money back if she wanted it. With the knives she carried lying in her dresser drawer, she had no doubt about her ability to take back the money, even if she had to make a pincushion out of him. Ronald picked her up and carried her over to the bed. He had already picked up the money and stuffed it down his pockets. He laid her out on the bed and lay down beside her. 
He undressed her slowly, then took her roughly, making her cry out as he punished her for her ignorance. Even as he made love, he made plans. It would be better, he reasoned, if he allowed her to lie around for a couple of days. All he had to do was keep his ish out of her after this. If she wanted any off, she would take her ass back to work with a passion. That was one thing he was sure of. Chapter 12 For the two brothers and their friend Tiny, problems have been mounting ever since they had all moved out and rented the house on the east side. The rent was due, and among them they only had 25 cents. It had taken the last money they had to get Tiny's old car out of the shop, but now they had it running, and they were sure they would soon have some money. You sure? Jimmy asked again as they poured cups of cold wine and rode down the street. You better damn well bet I'm sure, Tiny stated. We've been watching that numbers house for three weeks now, and I'm sure we can crack it. All we gotta do is go in as painters. I heard the woman talking in the store, and she told the girl behind the counter that she expected the painters to come tomorrow and begin their work. Buddy had remained silent all through the discourse. Now he ventured his remarks. I don't know, man. It don't seem likely that they will open the door for us. She must know what one of the painters looks like. Sure, I don't doubt that, Tiny answered. All we gotta do is wait until she makes one of her trips to pick up more money or tapes. Ish. Once we see that little old green car gone, we know she ain't there, because she's the only one who drives it. It makes sense, Jimmy replied quickly. He wanted some money, and didn't care what kind of chance they took. Anything makes sense to you, Jimmy, Buddy answered sharply, then added, But this ain't no toy, man. These people play for keeps. If we kick this joint over, we're going to have to play it mighty cool after that. Because they sure in the f ain't about to forget us. Aw, oh, man, Tiny said. Let's worry about skinning the cat when we get into it. For now, we got to knock the n off joint off. After that, then we'll worry about spending the cash. In the next few hours, they put their plan to work. All three of them dressed in white coveralls that were spattered with various colors of paint. Tiny stuck a small white cap on his head. Their first trip to the numbers house was in vain. They parked their car down the street and waited patiently until the woman they plotted on had left. From his position in the front seat, Jimmy was the first one to see the woman when she came out. There she is, he said excitedly. I don't know, man, Tiny replied as he gripped the steering wheel tightly. It's hard to tell from way back here if that's her or not. That ain't no problem, Buddy spoke up from the rear of the automobile. If she gets in the car, then we'll know if it's her or not. All we got to do is be patient. It's her, all right, Jimmy replied quickly. I can see her getting in the car. All three of the men strained to see her from her hidden position. They watched silently as the driver of the car backed out of the driveway, then drove off in the other direction. Tiny started the motor up and drove slowly to the house the woman had departed from. Man, Jimmy said nervously, Ain't you taking a risk pulling right up in front of the house? From the high pitch of his voice, Buddy could tell that his brother was scared. Hey, Jimmy, why don't you pull yourself together, man? Buddy ordered sharply. It would look foolish if he parked anywhere else but in front of the house. We're supposed to be the painters, right? So what the f***? Let's act like real painters. Once again, Buddy found himself put in the role of leader. 
Always when it came down to real thinking, both of the other men turned to Buddy for guidance. Buddy's right, Jimmy, Tiny said. You got to be real cool, man. This ain't no chump action we're getting ready to take off. This is the big time. Right on, Buddy added. Everybody check their peace and remember, ain't no shooting unless we ain't got no other choice. He waited to see if the others had any question before continuing. Now let's be cool. The technique we're going to work out should be perfect. All we got to do is take care of the business and remember, he warned. As soon as I step through the front door, I want both of you to be coming in on my heels. Jimmy and Tiny shook their heads in agreement as Buddy pushed on the car seat. Okay, Jimmy, let me out. Jimmy leaned forward so that his brother could push the car seat up. With a flip of his hand, Jimmy opened the door and waited until his brother got out. He could feel his legs shaking and knew he didn't have the nerve it took to go to the door by himself. If it was left up to him to start the ball game, it would never get started. He was just too frightened. He could follow orders, but someone else would have to lead. Buddy walked slowly up the pathway that led to the front door. He was nervous, but other than that, he was all right. His right hand went down to his waist. He felt the weight of the small thirty-two automatic he had concealed on his person. This was it, he told himself. This was the big one. Once they took it off, he would never again in life have to worry about asking his stepfather for help. The very thought of the security the money would bring helped to steady his nerves. When Buddy reached the front door, it was another matter. The convulsive shaking began in his knees and he thought about turning around and fleeing. If he hadn't knocked on the door, he would have bolted and run. But before he could, someone opened the heavy inside front door and peered out at him. He snatched at the dirty paint cap he wore, removing it from his head. With determination, he willed himself to use control. If he turned around and ran now, he would ruin everything. Miss, he began, noticing at once that it was a young girl glancing out at him. I'm the painter that the house lady requested to come over. We're supposed to start painting tomorrow, but I've got to see the rooms. Oh, yes, the woman replied, then added, But you were not expected until tomorrow. I know, he replied, then added, But like I say, I must see the room so that I'll know how much paint we're going to have to mix up tonight for the job tomorrow. Well, I'll have to check. Just a second, please. She didn't bother to close the door, but the screen door was still latched tightly, so he still couldn't enter the home. The large red brick house was just like the rest of the well-kept homes in the neighborhood, except for the doors. The front door was extra heavy, an old oak door that cost better than three hundred dollars. Two strong men could not possibly kick the door down unless they had some kind of tools at their disposal. A tall, burly black man came back to the door with the medium-sized brown-skinned woman. He stared out of the door at Buddy. Seeing nothing but a young black man standing there, he relaxed somewhat and released the lock on the outer door. As the door opened, Buddy wanted to glance back over his shoulder to see where his crime partners were hidden. He knew that they were supposed to be on the side of the house. His order had been for them to come on a run as soon as he entered, so he didn't waste any time. He stepped into the house. Without holding back, he instantly went into action. Snatching the gun, Buddy stepped back out of the reach of the burly black man. All right, he yelled. Don't nobody move. This is a stick up. What? The man exclaimed, not wanting to believe his eyes. He stared at the young man holding the gun. For a brief second, he was tempted to try and snatch the gun from out of the youth's hand. He didn't want to face the fact that he had been had. It was too much. The very thought was intolerable. 
It was incredible. He didn't want to believe that this young punk in front of him would have the nerve to try to stick them up. What was worse, he couldn't bring himself to accept it. He moved threateningly toward Buddy. As soon as Buddy saw the expression on the man's face, he raised the short thirty-two that he carried. Before he had a chance to shoot the man, the door busts open and Jimmy and Tiny came in. Both men were armed. They held their guns at the ready. Seething with anger, the burly man gained control. You punks will never get away with this sh**. I guess you realize that, don't you? But he let out a laugh. It relieved him of some of the tension that had built up inside of him. You let us be the one to worry about that, Buddy stated, then pointed the gun. Both of you get over there and lay down beside the couch. Quickly, Tiny and Jimmy had the man and woman bound hand and foot while Buddy explored the rest of the house. There were no other people there except a young, light-skinned girl in her early teens. She had long black hair down around her shoulders, and anyone could see that when she got older, she would be a beauty. Where the hell did you find her at? Tiny inquired as his lustful eyes swept over the young girl's body. Damn, but she's a fine huff of them, he added, not concealing his desire. The older woman moaned from the floor. She ain't nothing but a child, the woman said quickly. Good, Tiny answered her slowly, allowing his eyes to roam over the mother slowly. Hey, man, Jimmy yelled. We come for the cash, so let's get on with it. There ain't no problem there, Buddy stated. It's all on the top of the dining room table. You got the bag? Jimmy shook his head as he hurried past. A yell of delight came from him as soon as he saw the stacks of money beside the adding machines on the table. Man, oh man, how the hell do you like that? I ain't never seen as much cash, even at the bank. He began to shove stacks of money into the large brown shopping bag he removed from his belt where it had been folded. You, Tiny ordered a young girl, get down on the floor so I can tie you up like the others. The young girl began to cry as she obeyed the order. Where the hell was she? Tiny asked again as he took out a dirty hanky and stuffed it into the older woman's mouth. She was back in the den, Buddy answered, watching Tiny closely. He had an idea of what was going through the man's mind, and he didn't like it. She had the radio going on so loud that she hadn't even heard us come in. Tiny only shook his head as he tied the girl up. First, he tied her hands together, then he pulled the cord over to an old radiator and finished tying her to it. The only thing free now was her legs and those he didn't bother with. Before Buddy could move, Tiny ripped off the girl's white blouse. Her sticks stood out, not yet mature, but still firm and hard. Before the startled eyes of his partner and the watching couple, Tiny bent his head and began to s He slobbered over her innocent flesh. A loud sob escaped from the other woman as she watched her daughter being You no good, filthy motherfucker! The burly black man cursed. Though in his mind, he wished desperately that he could be the one enjoying the young girl. He had watched her dance in the den, and he knew she was a desirable young piece of trim. But it was a thought that he would never allow another person to know about. Despite his dislike of what Tiny was doing, Buddy would only watch silently. 
The sight of Tiny loving the girl filled Buddy with a burning desire. As the young girl twisted and turned, Tiny used one hand to rip her short skirt off. He didn't bother with pushing it up. He just gave it a vicious jerk and a cheap material tore. Next, the silk panties came off. Then he rolled down over her hips as she squirmed desperately. Oh, you dirty mother the bound man swore. If I can only have a second with you, you bastard you! Ish, Tiny said over his shoulder. What you really want is a second with this fine young shit, you silly ass huggin'. You don't ish me, I know. You just ain't had the nerve to take what was in front of you, that's all. As the mother of the girl squirmed around and sobbed loudly, Tiny took his larger finger and Her high scream was cut off as Tiny put his huge hand over her mouth. He didn't bother to remove his pants. He just tore the buttons off the pain outfit he wore and Buddy stared fascinated as the huge black <laughs> disappeared between the scales or All at once, a loud scream came from the girl, again cut off by Tiny's hand. Jimmy came rushing out of the dining room, carrying the brown bag stuffed full of money. He took one glance at the action and smiled. Man, y'all putting ice cream on top of the cake. Buddy stared angrily at his brother. But in his heart, he wished he had the nerve to f But he knew he was too ashamed. If she had been dragged off to one of the empty rooms, then he might have gotten a piece. But he would never be able to find the nerve to fuck in front of everybody. He doubted if his d Hurry up, man! Jimmy said as he set the paper bag down and leaned over Tiny. Man, oh man, you sure put in sang on your s- Before he could finish the sentence, Tiny let out a loud moan and slumped over the crying Splash. Before Tiny could get up, Jimmy had his pants open and was kneeling down right beside him. Bish, man, get off her. We ain't got all night, Jimmy said wildly. Tiny rolled off the crying and lay on the thick carpet. Oh, wow, he moaned. That's what I call tender p The girl tried to scream. She cried over and over and over again. The sound of her voice only added passion to Jimmy's burning desire. He forced himself into the tightly built. Before he could really hear her, he felt himself him Motherfucker! He swore. Ish, man, you talking about a 60 second man? You wasn't on that hot a minute! Let me have another go at her! He begged, waiting for Jimmy to get out of the way. If you do, Buddy stated loudly. You'll be here by your f***ing self. After making that statement, Buddy picked up the bag of money. He didn't even bother to look back because he didn't want to see the young girl. I'm leaving, he stated again. I came for the money, not to get out of one ear, so you can do whatever you want. I'm gone. Without warning, he opened the front door. And after a quick glance outside, he continued on his way. 
Struggling with desire, Tani pulled himself away. He cursed angrily, knowing that if he had had one more crack at the young girl, he would have really been able to bust her open. The second time, he reasoned, would have been longer and more enjoyable for the girl. He was conceited enough to think that he would have made her enjoy it, even though it was r Jimmy followed his partners out, glancing back to make sure everything was in order. He also cursed. He would have enjoyed another go at the girl, but he also knew that Buddy was right. They didn't have the time for playing. They had come for the money, and now that they had it, it was time to go. Three sets of eyes followed their progress out the door. The young girl was crying, yet thankful that her ordeal was over. Her mother was almost in a state of shock because of what she had witnessed. The burly bodyguard knew he had made a big mistake on his job. If it hadn't been for his stupidity, none of it would have happened. But now that it had, there was one thing he was sure of. The three young punks would be seen again. And he had no doubts about that. He remembered the hidden camera inside the house. Everything that had happened was now on film. The burly black man shivered as he thought about the rage the girl's father would be in once he saw the rerun of the film with his young daughter Yes, there would be hell to pay and some crying. But casket buying would be the order of the day in the near future.